Please turn in your back of your Psalter hymnals, page 876, to the Heidelberg Catechism, Lord's Day 9. In the Heidelberg Catechism, there are 37 questions that have to do with the Apostles' Creed. We are in the midst of them now. We're on Lord's Day number 9, which has only question 26. Some of the Lord's Day have as many as four. This one has just one. So I'm going to ask the question, and then together we'll answer. Question 26, Lord's Day 9. What do you believe when you say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth? That the eternal Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who out of nothing created heaven and earth and everything in them, who still upholds and rules them by his eternal counsel and providence, is my God and Father for the sake of Christ, his Son. I trust God so much that I do not doubt he will provide whatever I need for body and soul and will turn my good, whatever adversary he sends upon me, in this veil of tears. He is able to do this because he's Almighty God. He desires to do this because he's a faithful Father. What a wonderful statement of comfort to our souls. Four different texts throughout the Bible having to do with creation and God's care for us as his created children. First Psalm 33, verses 6 through 12. By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth all their host. He gathers the waters of the sea as a heap. He puts the deeps in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord, let all the inhabitants of the world Stand in awe of him, for he spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He frustrates the plans of the peoples. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart to all generations. Blessed is the nations who God is the Lord, the people whom he has chosen as his heritage. Matthew chapter 6, the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, affirming that God is our Father. Matthew 6, 28 through 33. And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon and all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all these things will be added to you. Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through Him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts to the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. And then the, the fourth text is Ephesians chapter 1, verses 10 through 12, accenting God's sovereignty. as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in Him, 
things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. Heavenly Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit would be with us and bind us to the triune God as his children, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. There's a hymn, we did not sing it today, but it's a famous hymn that the Christian church has loved to sing. It's called, How Great Thou Art. How Great Thou Art. O Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. And when through the woods and through forest glades I wander and hear the birds and that sing sweetly in the trees, when I look down from lofty mountain grandeur and hear the brook and feel the gentle breeze, then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. That hymn goes on to sing how great God's redemption is in Christ. So that you have two major sources for being able to reflect upon the greatness of God. His creation and His redemption. Redemption we learn about through our Bibles. We can't look upon the creation and discover redemption. We, redemption must be proclaimed to us. And we learn of redemption from our Bibles, but of creation we can look and see. And because of that, we what? We should respond. Praise God, how great thou art. Shouldn't we? What a place we live here in Fresno and Clovis. A few hours we can go to the coast and we can see the grandeur of the ocean. We were there recently. Stayed in a nice, nice little motel. But my, my, when my wife wanted to go out and get a picture, you know, she get, guess what she wanted to get a picture of? The motel? No. She wanted to go to the ocean and see the sun coming down. The grandeur of God's creation. Well, we can take an hour and a half and we can see the mountains. The grandeur. The wonder of His handiwork. Since creation is a source of our worship for God, you ought to get out more. You ought to explore the world. I have a friend of mine who has a, 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 a map of the stars. And he has a very powerful telescope, big telescope. Have, and he looks through a little moniker on the side of it. And he's able to look up and all those, the, the universe just, draws near to him and he can see it and identify and map out all these things. I don't know anybody that knows the sky and the stars and their positions and constellations better than he does. But what does it do? It, what, it, it evokes in the heart of the believer worship, awe, reverence, amazement, wonder. And so too the Heidelberg Catechism here is it accents this opening portion of the Apostles' Creed, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. It brings us into the wonder of knowing God as the Almighty Creator. But also, not only is He the Almighty Creator to stand back in wonder and awe, but He is also the same God as our loving Father to draw near to through Christ. But first, let us consider Him as Creator the Heidelberg Catechism, and the eternal Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who out of nothing created heaven and earth and everything in them. 
Ever make something? Ever make some muffins? Ever make a portrait? Ever do something that you say, ah, and stand back and look at, ah, that, I'm glad I did that. You ever do that? You know, whatever it is that you made, you didn't make the materials. And whatever you made, you didn't make it out of nothing. God made all things out of nothing. That's impressive. <laughs> that is impressive. R.C. Sproul, I uh, always like to ask the question, why is there something rather than nothing? <laughs> because of God's will and mind and his, his handiwork. He also wrote a book called Not a Chance. All things exist not because they came out of chance but out of God, His Word, His plan. Psalm 33, verse 6. By the Word of the Lord, the heavens were made. By the breath of His mouth, their host. Breath means the Spirit. So it's Word and Spirit together. And of course, that's what we find in Genesis chapter 1. God said in the Spirit is there working, applying, bringing it home. Let all the earth, verse 8 says, fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of Him. Why? Because He spoke and it came to be. <laughs> That's why. It's impressive. We should be amazed at this God. I read Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 21, which are the wrong responses to God. He's revealed Himself to us. We know He's there. We can't help it. And to be able to say, well, I'm an atheist. Or I don't see it. It's a lie. It's contrary to what you actually know, breaking into your hearts. To repress the truth and unrighteous, suppress it. That's the evil of the human heart. So brothers and sisters, let us admire God's handiwork. Let us marvel in awe of Him that made it, and tremble before His holy majesty. And let us consider that it is He who created it all. Let us respond to Him accordingly. And also recognize that He who created it all also controls it all. You know, the God of the Bible is not the God of the deist. You know, the God of the deist is God made the world like a person winding up a clock and then withdrew and the clock's wound up and, you know, carries on. It's not the biblical view of God created. The God who created all, everything also controls everything. As the Heidelberg Catechism goes on to say, who still upholds and rules them by His eternal counsel and His providence. So, too, Psalm 33 captures this same reality uh, as it moves from God's creation to God's control of that creation. Verse 10 of Psalm 33. He spoke, it came to be. Verse 9, verse 10, the Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He frustrates the plans of the peoples. That's, that's man's counsel and plans. But verse 10, the Lord brings the counsel of uh, I, I'm sorry, verse 11, the counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of His heart to all generations. God is, God is working out His counsel, His wisdom, His plan, and He's concretely working it out through all generations. That means through all of time. He not only started this theater in which He manifests His glory, He's the one who brings about the cast and tells them what the what the written uh, play is. What their parts are in it. He's the God of providence. The God who's ruling and reigning in it all. And so Ephesians chapter 1 that we read uh, tells us that He's working all things out after the counsel of His will. A counsel that's going to culminate in what? Bringing together heaven and earth. See, heaven and earth were created as separate phenomena. Heaven is, 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 the, is the earthly created palace of God. He dwells, our heavenly Father. The earth is the lower regions. Well, in Jesus Christ, what's going to happen? He's going to bring those two 
entities together, and by bringing those two entities together, earth is going to be glorified, heavenized forever. He's the one controlling that show to bring it to that ultimate consummation. And if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you'll be able to enter into that wonderful reality, that glorified world that Peter calls the new heavens and new earth. Now, in the meantime, while we head in that direction, we often don't grasp and we don't understand what the Lord is doing exactly. We are often deterred and we struggle with things. We ask, well, why did that happen that way? And we are, our cage is rattled. I mean, just think of the Apostle Paul for a moment, if you would. Christ came to him, saved him, and said, okay, Paul, and I want you to go preach the gospel to the nations. Paul was fired up. He took off to do that, to preach the gospel around, all around Asia. You can read about his missionary journeys in the book of Acts. But what must have gone through Paul's head when he went to Rome and he's chained down to a Roman guard? How do I preach the gospel to the nations? Chained to this one guy 24 7, right? He must have been a little deterred, wondering how this is supposed to work out. Or how about when he's traveling on the ship to go to another land and preach the gospel, and, and God brings a storm and busts up the ship? What must he have thought then? Or what must he have thought when he had his missionary band together and one of his lead men, Mark, flakes out? Now, if you know much about the book of Acts, the second go-round with Mark, Paul said, no, I already, I already had Mark. I don't want to do it. Barnabas said, oh, no, come on, come on. Let's take him aboard again. No, won't do it. Too big of a letdown last time. What must have Paul thought when he is facing these kind of obstacles of thinking, this doesn't seem to add up? And so God's providence in our life often uh, comes to us in such a way where we say, this doesn't add up. Why this? This doesn't seem to glorify the Lord. God's control of all things is not easy to integrate into our lives. It's not easy. And sometimes, sometimes, we may begin to think that God is even cruel. When a life is cut short, when illness or pain is protracted, Beyond the breaking point. When doubts arise about how am I going to make ends meet, I'm afraid and even despairing. Or when I can't ever seem to cut the mustard. I try this, I can't make it in that, I tried that, I can't, you know, no matter what, I can't seem to cut it. I'm always the last guy chosen for the team. All right, come on, Jimmy, we'll take you. How can that be? Whether it's at school or at work or in my career, we can get discouraged, we can get depressed. But we've got to recall as those who believe that God controls things, what He is our Father as well. And even though His immutable plans may be mysterious to us as they concretely play out in our lives, behind a frowning providence, is the Father's smile, the great byword of the hymn. He cares, the third point in your outline. Matthew chapter 6, verse 25, Jesus assures us, God can take care of the birds and God can take care of grass. He'll take care of you. You're more important than birds and grass. Hopefully that's somewhat comforting. I'm more important than a bird or a grass. Okay. <laughs> but he's actually saying more than that. He's saying, look, your father, who's controlling all, does indeed personally have oversight. Personal oversight and a heart of care for you if you're a believer of Jesus Christ and a member of his family. And that's why in the Heidelberg Catechism it goes on to say, I trust God so much. When I first read that, I said, I wish they'd just say, I trust God, rather than I trust God so much. I, I feel so small. 
I don't trust God so much. I trust God. Heidelberg kind of digs into me there. I trust God so much that I do not doubt. <laughs> well, <laughs> he'll provide whatever I need for body and soul and will turn my good, whatever adversity he sends upon me in this veil of tears. We trust God. 1 Peter 5, 7, the text I used for my very first sermon over 50 years ago. God, cast all your cares upon Him. Why? Because He cares for you. And we're, we're supposed to integrate that and remember that. That God's heart cares for you. And find consolation there and confidence to be able to commit to Him what's troubling us so deeply. And because of that, I can derive comfort. I can derive comfort. The whole Heidelberg Catechism is a catechism of comfort. What is your only comfort in life and death? That I'm not my own, but belong body and soul in life and death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with His precious blood. God will not be clubbing me for my sins because He's paid for them. He's also delivered me from the tyranny of the devil. He also, there it is, watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation. That's comfort. I belong to this God through Christ. This great, majestic Creator. He is my Father. And He has made you, He has made me who I am. He's made you who you are. And he has made you with a, a, a distinctive combination of physical and non-physical characteristics, of talents and looks, all for his purposes. There are certain things about you that are essentially not changeable. All right? If you imagine a picture, you know, a picture has a frame. When the artist gets the frame, what? The frame is static. He's not going to work anymore in the frame. The frame is what it is. But inside the picture, the real picture that the artist wants to paint, he does his work. And that's just like you. There are certain things about you that they are. You know? I used to be consumed with envy toward my best friend in college who I roomed with because he was so smart. So smart. I just felt so small <laughs> before him. But God made me. There's things about me that he didn't have. But I wasn't made for me. And you're not made for you. You're made for God. With your unique combination that at the end of the day goes into who you are. And we should be content You should be content. He will turn to my good whatever adversity He sends upon me in this veil of tears. Do you know what that word veil means? Veil of tears? I used to think it meant a veil, like lifting a veil, but I, that's not the word. That's V-E-I-L. This is V-A-L-E. It means valley. Even old guys can learn something new. A valley, this valley of tears. So the Christian life is a life that involves adversity. Involves things that hurt and sting and deter and discourage. It's not a cakewalk. Christian life is not some oblivious, upbeat, uh, tiny Tim tiptoeing through the tulips, playing his ukulele. Now, there are tulips involved. There's one tulip involved in the Christian life. If you're a good Calvinist, that is. I hope you are. Because this is what we're talking about. We're talking about a God who's not kind of interfacing, trying to get a handle on things. 
talking about the sovereign God, the God of the tulip that took root in Holland. So there is a tulip involved, but not Tiny Tim and his tip, tipping through the tulip, tulips obliviously. That's the version some people seem to paint of the Christian life. It's not true, though. But the point is that this great sovereign creator and controller cares for you and me if we are believers in Jesus Christ. And he has designed the obstacle course for your life to work your way through. And it's a great comfort to know that the God who's designed the obstacle course is my Father who goes with me through it. The great comfort as I face life's challenges and obstacles and setbacks and suffering. And therefore, I have good reason to do what? To trust God. To trust God and not cave. To trust God and not go run into the corner and suck my thumb. Whee! But trust Him. Get on with it. And you will be discouraged. You will want to suck your thumb at times. But that's not the defining moment. You need to return to Him and say, Lord, I'm trusting You. Because why? Because it's through conflict that the Lord is doing what? The great painter, the great sculptor that He is in your life is creating an artistic piece in and through you through conflict. That's what Romans 5 says. Uh, informed us of, right? Romans 5 opens up telling us and assuring us we're justified by faith through Jesus Christ and we have peace with God. We're reconciled to God, the God of heaven. We have peace with Him. We're no longer His enemy. We're His child. Privileged position now. Now having that settled by faith, we stand in this grace-oriented relationship with God. We have hope of the glory of God. I know the outcome. Because I'm justified now, I know the, how the end will be. The glory of God. Praise God. But now in between those two realities, Romans 5 goes on to say, we also rejoice in our sufferings. Why? Knowing that suffering produces perseverance, and perseverance produces character, and character produces hope. Because the love of God is poured out in my life. Two anchors. Two anchors here. The love of God is secured to me because I have peace with Him through faith in Jesus Christ, my justifier. And thus, consequently, I have the gift of the Holy Spirit communicating to me God's love through life and hope, the outcome. Now, those two things are to be two strong steel titanium beams in your soul, the love of God and hope at the end because you are justified by faith in Jesus. And then knowing now that he's at work through life's variegated circumstances and you can trust him. You might get derailed from it, but you can trust him. You need to return to these realities so that you will trust him. And we can humble ourselves and we can take on these challenges in life, seeking to honor and glorify Him. Seeking to avoid the buildup of bitterness and hostility and rebelliousness that creep in so often. And continuing to get cleansing, forgiveness. And then there has a very practical result of this knowledge of, of what God is doing. The, the great Creator, the great artist who is at work in your life through these tools that Paul is talking about to accomplish what? The building of who you are. The beauty of who you are inside. Inside the frame. That's what changes. As he matures you in Jesus Christ to be molded into his beautiful likeness. It's the one singular person that God in the unique confluence of who you and I are is seeking to shine through. I love how the Heidelberg Catechism ends this. He's able to do this because he's almighty God. 
Our God's not a marshmallow. He's Almighty God. And He desires to do this. He's willing to do this because He's a faithful Father. Bringing those two realities of His greatness and His care together in our lives. And this should bring us, brothers and sisters, this should bring to each of our hearts encouragement. Uh, the spell check would not agree uh, with my word, encouragement. Because I invented that word. I've not invented many words, but I invented encouragement. It's the new word. It's a word that, that combines encouragement with courage. And so that's what all this should provide for us is encouragement. Encouragement First of all, in knowing who God is and that through Jesus Christ I'm reconciled to Him and He is my Father. As He takes me through this world. And thus I can live life seeking to be close to Him, seeking Him as my happiness, not all this stuff out here. But seeking Him as the source of my happiness, seeking to be centered and anchored and close to Him a life that is growing and maturing as I continue to pursue Him in all of life's variegated situations. That I should be encouraged by that. To think that of this God, I can call Him Abba, like a little kid trusting in His parent. Beautiful. But also, this reality should give me courage. Courage. Courage to engage my responsibilities and not be afraid. Not, not allow fear to run my life. But courage. Courage that will take scary risks. You know one of the scariest risks is talking to someone about something you know they don't want to talk about. <laughs> and you got to broach it. <laughs> That's scary, isn't it? But what does it mean? If, if you're living in Christ, you have a whole backdrop to take these little risks in life and, and to speak up. To say something for Jesus. To not back down when something's wrong and you're asked to compromise. To have courage. Courage comes where? Not by screwing up your courage, but by looking up to the God who gives you courage. Your Father. Through Jesus Christ. He is the one that gives you not only encouragement, but courage. And thus he's the one that, out of whom we can derive encouragement. Psalm 56, David was being stalked. And he says, when I'm afraid, I put my trust in you. In God whose word I praise. In God I trust. I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? And then again he says, in God I trust. That should be written on a coin, I think. That's, that, that's, that, that's, that's how good that statement is. They should put it on currency. Because it's a good saying. It also tells us something about currency. I should not be trusting in currency. In God I trust. 5611. I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? So take encouragement. When we say in the Apostles' Creed, I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. Let us say it, and then let us walk by faith in Him, in Christ. Delighting to know this great God as my summum bonum, my greatest good, my chief reason in life, as my Creator who controls all things, who is also my Father, who truly cares for me in Jesus Christ, even through this valley of tears, till He brings me to the mountain of His home.
my home through Christ. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, how we thank